You're right in D.C. with Gail Trotter. This is Gail Trotter, host of Right in D.C. Today, I'm so excited about my guest, Chip Roy. Chip is a longtime friend of mine, and I would call him an ideological compadre. And Chip, congratulations on your exciting victory to represent the 21st District of Texas to the U.S. House of Representatives. Well, thanks, Gail. Thanks for having me on. And it's really great to be with you. Uh, and uh, it's a long ways from the mean streets of Richmond, Virginia, in our time. <laughs> <laughs> Miss youth out of right after college and law school, but uh, it's great to be on with such a great friend and somebody who's a great patriot for and standing up for all the things we believe in. Thank you. Yes, Chip and I have worked on a lot of these issues over many years, and I would say that we both revere the Constitution and our civil liberties and rights under the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And uh, we both went, attended the University of Virginia, which, of course, was founded by Thomas Jefferson. And uh, Chip has gone on to be really involved in politics. He worked under Ken Paxton, who I had the honor of meeting at the recent Federal Society Conference in D.C. a couple weeks ago. You also worked with Rick Perry and another perennial favorite, Ted Cruz. Uh, some of these issues I think that you have really focused on are coming to a fore right now. You are representing Texas, and we see all the issues about secure borders, building the wall, illegal immigration, the idea that a nation cannot be a nation if it cannot regulate its borders and determine who qualifies to be a citizen or not. So this is the huge news this week, pictures of you know, moms with their children and tear gas and reporters standing behind them with cameras. So you're gonna come to Washington. This is one of the issues you wanna tackle. What do you think could help with this very important issue? Well, I appreciate that. Of course, that's a big question, but it's one that I've been focused on a lot in my career and over my life, both uh, as a uh, lawyer on the Senate Judiciary Committee. I worked on these bills as many as 10 years ago, uh, legislation involving immigration. I was a federal prosecutor in the U.S. Attorney's Office prosecuting people who are here illegally, as you mentioned, Senator Cruz's chief of staff, and then as the first assistant attorney general. Right? We, we sued in federal court to stop the previous president, President Obama's illegal executive amnesty. So I've been immersed in this for a long time. And here's the thing that I think we should all come back to as conservatives. We all believe as conservatives that we have a, a duty as a sovereign nation, a basic duty to secure our border, that it's fundamental, right? That the president has the authority in Article 2 to defend our border and that it's just a basic proposition that as a, a sovereign nation, you should defend your border. But we also recognize that we're a nation of immigrants. We have laws that allow people to come here legally and we have laws on the books for asylum for people who are seeking refuge. And as a, a welcoming nation, uh, that's a good thing. The problem is, is it's being abused. We know it's being abused. Everybody knows it's being abused. Left, right, doesn't matter where you are on the political spectrum. So I think the first thing we need to do, the order of business, is to be honest about what we're dealing with, right, with a caravan. The vast majority of the people that are in this caravan are not seeking asylum. They're walking right past Border Patrol agents. They walk right through places in Mexico where they had security and safety. This is a political statement for the vast majority of them. There are a few, no doubt, who would like to seek asylum who are being left by the wayside. And this is the point that I want to make, Gail, that I think you'll agree with and appreciate. I'm sick and tired of real people getting hurt, little girls getting sold into the sex trafficking business along the border, mothers dying in the desert trying to come across our border and being out in the middle of the desert and, and, and dying from dehydration. Children dying because they're on the top of train cars trying to come to our country. Or in the case of the fo few photos that we've seen of a mom with little kids on the border uh, just south of, of the California border. All of this is stuff that is caused by people who bury their head in the sand and don't want to do the basic duty that we should as a country to defend our borders, secure our borders, and send a strong message to the world that you're welcome to come here but you're only welcome to do so following our laws. And that we're not gonna have this false compassion that people put out there. And frankly, a lot of people, people of faith, uh, that put false compassion out there that somehow open borders is good for immigrants. It is not, it's endangering immigrants. And we're seeing it right now. And right now today, the Southern border of Texas, Southern border of California, Arizona, and Mexico, a little girl or more than that 
will get sold into the sex trade because we're allowing cartels to have operational control of our border. And we're doing so because liberals in both parties and people that don't want to enforce our borders are allowing it to happen. It's really important that you brought this up. Ken Paxton spoke about this. Ken Paxton, who is the current attorney general of Texas, who you previously worked for, uh, he spoke about this when he was at the Federalist Society conference about how his office realized that there's a huge human trafficking problem. And he allocated part of his resources to setting up division or an office that could really address that issue. And I'd like to underscore that point that you said that open borders is not helping immigrants. And I think, unfortunately, what you hear from Democrats and their allies in the media is that Republicans don't support this core principle of American values that we are a welcoming nation. And we do thrive from the influx of people who support American values and want to come here and have a better life for their families and contribute to the welfare of this country. And how can conservatives fight back against that caricature and complete falsehood about how conservatives view legal immigration and immigrants and other cultures? Well, I think it starts by just focusing on the facts of what we're dealing with on the ground and making sure that everybody in the, the, the American people know the truth. When I went out and was campaigning in Texas 21, which for your listeners is the district that stretches between Austin and San Antonio and then out through a good part of the hill country. So what you would call central Texas, maybe slightly south central Texas, but central Texas. We're not the, the western end of my district is only about 100 miles or so from the border. So as you can imagine. Border security and immigration is very important to the people of this district. Now, to be clear, there are a lot of people of faith in this district who believe that we should be welcoming. There are a lot of people in this yes. district of businesses who know that we need uh, a steady stream of labor, and not all of that is necessarily coming from the United States, and that it's, it's good to have some labor from uh, other parts of the world when it's appropriate. And so there's a lot of needs here, and people get it, but it's still the number one issue, and it always starts from top to bottom with a few exceptions. It starts with a basic understanding that it is in our interest to secure the border and in the interest of immigrants. And I think this is what we don't do a good job of as uh, Republicans or conservatives, is explaining the extent to which it is far better for immigrants around the world that they know the rules, that they follow the rules, that it'll be safer and better for them coming to our country. And that it also sends a message to the world that we defend the rule of law. I mean, what differentiates the United States from every other country in the world or most countries in the world, particularly our, our, our neighbor to the South, Mexico, and some of our neighbors in Central, Mex uh, Central America, is that we follow the rule of law. Not always exactly like you and I would prefer, by the way. Right. But as a general matter, the United States follows the rule of law. You can know that when you invest your money in a business, you're going to be able to get it. If you own property, you're going to be able to keep it. The government's not going to confiscate it. Cartels aren't going to come undermine your ability to do your job. Uh, take care of your families. You're secure generally. If we abandon the rule of law in the very in the false name of compassion to have open borders for people to come here, and then in the process we're making it difficult on them anyway, and they're endangering their lives, that is a losing message. It's much like us winning the the battle for life, right? Right. Democrats on defensive that they're for the extermination of life. You know, we're winning that argument. Let's win this argument. We're for right human uh, flourishing. We're for people doing well and for a secure nation. And I think we win. Well, Chip, I love that you talk about human flourishing because that's from Aristotle. And that is a motto of mine. That is a purpose of my mission. And I think this is really fascinating because the title of this podcast is called Right in D.C., and you and I know so many people run for Congress. This is even on your website. I recommend everybody go to your website and see what issues you care about and which ones you're going to come to Washington, D.C. to talk about it. But how many conservatives campaign that they are pro-Second Amendment, pro-borders, pro-free uh, market, you know, pick, pick any issue. And then they come to D.C. and they get swamp fever. They become part of the swamp. They become part of the entrenched 
establishment in Washington, D.C., even the ones who speak the best game, maybe they're sincere when they do it. So my question for you, good friend, is how did you decide to get involved in politics? Because I think the reason a lot of conservatives don't get involved in politics is because they're so disgusted by what happens in D.C. And you will be coming to D.C. from Texas. You've been here before. Uh, what do you see the pitfalls are for you and anyone else like you of strong conservative principles? And how are you going to fight the influences of the swamp? Well, there's a lot to unpack there, but I think if you want to cut to the chase, you ask the first question is why would I, why did I, or why am I involved in politics? And it's a great question. I'm sitting down here right now in an office with a bunch of people who create a lot of jobs that I'm currently involved with until I uh, was sworn in in Washington. There's a lot to be said for being out in the private sector and and uh, being out uh, trying to create wealth, create jobs, or even in the public sector, being back in Texas and not being in Washington, where at least in Texas, where are surrounded by Texans and doing Texas things and, and yes. I'm proud of being a Texan. But I'll tell you this, you know, and you're, some of your listeners may know, I'm a cancer survivor. And seven years ago, I was uh, declared cancer-free this last October, seventh anniversary, uh, after going through stage three Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, I promised myself, I promised my wife and then my kids, who at the time were two years old and three months old, that I would leave everything on the field, uh, trying to pr pr uh, preserve and protect the republic for them. I believe it's our duty to try to work hard to pass down to our kids a better country than even we inherited. Uh, we have problems. We have issues. We have concerns. You and I both have a, I think, well-founded fear that we're losing the very freedoms that gave this country its its uh, prosperity and its greatness and a, a faith in the almighty. Uh, these are things that you and I share. But we also, I think, share the, the idea that it's the greatest country the world has ever known. It remains the greatest country the world has ever known. And our job is to preserve and protect it. And look, I'm optimistic. You know, I wrote a piece in National Review two years ago, almost exactly two years ago this week, two, maybe last week, in National Review called Unity Through Federalism. And in it, I talked about how in the response to Trump being elected, the left was losing their mind, right? Going yeah, up a yes. <laughs> now, look, in fairness, not terribly unlike our losing our mind when President Obama was elected. Then he was Great doing point. projects and passing Obamacare and racking up debt. And my point was simply this. We should all agree that it would be far better if we were to devolve power back to the states and to people so that we didn't have to live at each other's throats and, and have to try to come up with one size fits all solutions from Washington for 330 million people, but rather agree to disagree. Let Texas be Texas. Let California be California. California wants to ban straws or try to, you know, single payer health care or, you know, go with a high tax uh, kind of structured environment. Let them, you right. know. Let Texas do the same thing and flourish. We will not be able to solve all the world's problems and try to have one size fits all solutions for America. So I believe that's the way we get unity back. And if we can just get people to agree in this environment, look, I have no interest in telling people in New York, California what to do. I don't in the slightest bit. I just want to be free in Texas without people in Washington or San Francisco or New York telling me what to do. So that's what motivates me. And that, look, how do you avoid the swamp? by going up there and just being honest and being truthful about what you ran on and then honoring that commitment. That's it. And then recognize that your life doesn't rise or fall on on uh, winning or losing an election. And this last point I'll make, turn it back over to you. Last week we had, or the week before Thanksgiving, we had our, uh, I don't know, orientation or whatever they call it. You right. go to Congress critters and sit up there on your bleachers and take your pictures and go get shuttled around. <laughs> You know, it's all it fine. That's great. It's fun. You can meet some, meet some of your freshman class. But really what was interesting about it to me was the entirety of the conversation that Republicans were having from leadership on down was, what are we going to do to get power back? Wow. When in 2020? And look, if your response to getting your bottom handed to you uh, a couple of weeks prior, when we have a 4% economic growth environment, is to just suddenly go back and say, well, we just got to figure out how to raise more money and how to come up with a system so that we can get elected and win and win in 2020. And we, That's the wrong thing. Get back to what you were elected to do, why you, you ran in the first place, and go back and win minds and hearts and talk to the American people about why limited government and freedom and free enterprise are good for them, why free market health care will provide them the far better health care options that they could possibly have anywhere else. Um, talk about how a secure border is good for our country and immigrants. Uh, don't run away from your, your views and your beliefs because you're trying to figure out a way to, you know, manipulate a Rubik's Cube to figure out a way to win votes. 
if you if, go run and do what you want to do. And then if, if you lose, you lose. I think we'll win more if we do that. This is such a great point, Chip. And we have been, you and I have been part of so many conversations that have been autopsies after Republicans have lost different elections, uh, national elections, uh, power in, in various ways. And there is always bifurcated response to that type of loss. I remember after Romney lost and there was the RNC, the Republican autopsy about why Romney lost, and there was a push to what I always call out Democrat the Democrats. So you have the people on one side who feel like the Republicans are not liberal enough. And if they would just become more liberal and be more like the Democrats, they wouldn't have to be as extreme as the Democrats, but they would be able to have a little bit of free market principles in, in opposition to someone like, say, Alexandria Cortez from New York. Right. The other people are saying, no, Republicans are not being true to their principles. And I think you and I have seen this over and over again when Republicans lose, that there is this argument between these two factors. I think you and I probably share the opinion, and I think you just very art articulately put it, you can't out-Democrat the Democrats. So if, if Republicans are trying to change their core principles, that's that doesn't seem like a path to victory to me. Look, I completely agree, and I can tell you that you know the the, the autopsy has already uh, started. And uh, as a general matter, where I'm hearing people go with it is something in the zip code of Act Blue and money that we need to fight that machine. In other words, it was a structural problem, not a not a philosophical one or one of honoring your commitments. I disagree with that. There are obviously things we need to improve structurally, but people will give you money if you give them a reason to give you money. And frankly. Uh, while, you know, I don't always agree with everything uh, that Trump says or does or the way he does things, but you can't argue with, you know, good judges getting out of the clean power plan, getting out of the so-called Paris Agreement, uh, you know, eliminating regulations and those kinds of things. But what you can recognize is that Congress was failing to do what it said it would do. And people, frankly, I ran against Congress. Uh, you know, I, I don't right. know. If, you know, a lot of people don't understand that. But when, when I go back and explain it, I said, look, the vast majority of my time, from the time I was in the primary all through the general election, I was running against this Republican Congress, against trillion dollar deficits. I was running against socialized medicine that was their watered down versions of Obamacare. I was running against open borders. I was running against the centralization of power in Washington at the expense of Texas and liberty and limited government. And all of these are things that were occurring or expanding on Republican watch. So I think you're exactly right that we need to, to, to not be trying to sell Democrat light, but rather sell something that would be win minds and hearts and make people excited to get behind a conservative agenda. I'll make one other point, if you might, if you'll let me. It's so important what you're doing. And I talked to my wife about this, who's a, who's a conservative woman uh, as well, about how important it is for the narrative to get out of conservative women who are moms or, or, or work in the, in the workforce and or a mom or just work in the workforce, about how many conservative women are out there. This gender gap is overstated. I think we've got, you know, the reality is we're we're allowing the Democrats to, you know, win areas where they shouldn't win. But I think the gender gap is overstated. We just don't have a good uh, narrative out there explaining why freedom works and why freedom sells for moms and for working women. Well, I'm, I'm going to I'm not going to push back on that. I'm going to agree with you, Chip, and I'm going to challenge uh, people in the conservative movement to support conservative women more. Uh, I don't think it's a gender bias thing. I don't think it's a you know a way that is something that is negative about conservative women. But I think there is a missed opportunity when you have support going for lots of interesting think tanks and this and that, but I think there's a real uh, need to support conservative women and conservative women organizations that sometimes seem like the forgotten stepchild and don't get the kind of support that they need. And I, I'm not sure what the fix is to that, but I'm sure you will be on top of that since you've mentioned that in your very, you know, our very first discussion before you've even come back to DC as an elected official. So thank you for that, Chip. You mentioned Obamacare several times. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you were working as Senator Cruz's chief of staff when he, it was not actually 
a shutdown. Everybody gets this wrong, but he stood up on the floor of the Senate and kind of yelled, standing, stop standing athwart history about Obamacare. And I interviewed Matt Lewis, who's a columnist at the Daily Beast and a CNN commentator, and he is a strong ideological conservative, but we saw this very differently. And he wrote in his book about that particular episode with Senator Cruz. Matt Lewis's interpretation of that was it was so wrongheaded and it was so destructive to the Republican Party that it helped the Republican Party because they then they knew not to do that. Hmm. And I told him my interpretation of it was just the opposite. That was because of that that strategic decision by Senator Cruz in the fall of 2013, the Republicans were able to win the Senate in 2014. And I thought it was because Senator Cruz was able to distinguish the Republican position on health care versus the Democratic position on health care. But like you said, President Trump, we can agree or disagree. I mean, sometimes President Trump disagrees with himself. You talking about running against Congress. I mean, this has got to be one of the best examples of how you can run against Congress. They finally had the House. They said, give us the Senate. They got the Senate. They said, give us the presidency. They got the presidency. And what? What What happened with Obamacare? Nothing. Nothing Nothing that, that was as substantial as should have been done couple things on that. And I'm glad you brought it up. It's obviously something very important to me, near and dear to my heart, um, both because I'm a cancer survivor, but also because I've been in the thick of the fight. And you mentioned the time when uh, when uh, Senator Cruz was on the floor in his first year in the Senate. And you rightly differentiate the uh, whole uh, description of him, I think, wrongly, that it was all about a shutdown, as opposed to uh, doing our level best to try to defund Obamacare. Is rewind the clock in 2013. What we knew was coming was full implementation of Obamacare, was coming right around the corner. Right. This was our last chance to do what we, we could to restructure Obamacare while we had President Obama in the White House and set the stage for repeal, knowing full well that premiums were going to double and triple. So with all due respect to Matt, whom I like and I've known for a long time, uh, and, and certainly respect uh, differing opinions on all of this, is with all due respect, I don't really care what the political result would have been. Okay, let me right. just start there. <laughs> what, I care, what I care about are the premiums for Americans that were going to go up for the families that can't afford health care because Republicans are too gutless and cowardly to actually stand up and fight for health care freedom so that you can afford to go to the doctor of your choice and be able to get the health care of your choosing and get the medicine of your choosing instead of this watered down government run nonsense that we as Republicans are allowing to occur. And number two, I believe it was politically beneficial. I believe, as you point out, we did very well in 2014. We did very well in 2016 after we actually stood up and fought. American people are just hungry for people to stand up and do what they say they will do. And people were energized, mesmerized by what we were trying to accomplish and, and try to do. Did we do everything perfectly? Of course not. But what you're trying to do is stand up and fight and give a message for people to get behind. So I think politically it's beneficial to do that. But I also think it's more important than that. Democrats knew in 2009-10 when they jammed Obamacare through with a razor thin 60 vote Kennedy and the whole votes and all that. Right, right. They jammed it through knowing there would be political repercussions. They knew it and they didn't care because they have a view for the long game. They were like, look, we've got the opportunity right now to take a giant step towards socialized medicine. They were saw the ability to do that and they were willing to take the hit and they did take a hit and they lost 60 seats in the House. And we know how, where things then shifted. And what did Republicans do? We just started selling watered down health care to last year with Obamacare. I get so mad at Republicans who just run around like chickens with their heads cut off talking about, well, our bill provided coverage for pre-existing conditions and our bill would keep these pieces of Obamacare, but it would make it better and fix it this way. And <laughs> the individual mandate and the employer mandate. And do you think anybody in America cares about any of that? No. What they care about is having affordable health care, period. So you either got to get busy selling why competition in health care will work and drive down costs and give you opportunities to have you know, direct primary care. Go to your doctor so you can actually get somebody who does house calls. And you pay them 50 bucks a month and they come take care of you because you don't need insurance to have regular health care. And it'd be a lot cheaper than the, you know, co-pays and the deductibles that you're currently paying with your astronomical health insurance plans. Have health sharing ministries and health sharing organizations defray costs. 
have actual insurance that is catastrophic coverage that would be really affordable. And if you do all of that and couple with other changes and drive down drug costs by getting rid of the safe harbor protections that are enriching the middlemen and, and these large companies at the expense of, of, of uh, citizens, you can do extraordinary things to have the access to the best health care in the world. But we are at a critical point right now. We've got to choose whether we're going to have freedom, health care freedom. I don't talk about Obamacare repeal anymore. I talk about health care freedom. We either want that or we can go down the road of government run, uh, bureau bureaucracy run health care. By the way, one last point, this idea that this middle ground we're in right now is good, where we subsidize insurance companies, enrich insurance companies to basically be the provider of care for us so that you have to call some 25 year old in Nebraska on the other end of a phone <laughs> looking at a schedule of payments to tell you what your health care is. It's absurd. Yet that's what Republicans go out there and say, well, don't worry about it. We'll take care of your pre-existing additions. No, you won't. You're causing the cost to go up so much that it makes it impossible for me to get the care that I want in the first place. You're not taking care of anything. So our job is to win the narrative about what we can achieve if we free up the markets. And and uh, I'm not going to just sit back and let these guys kind of run to the hills like they normally do. Right. And I think you make a great point that health insurance is not the same thing as health care. And uh, when people are trying to push government run central command uh, mm -hmm. health policy, medical policy, they're pushing the insurance. And instead of trying to figure out what's the best way to deliver health care to the most people for the most economical uh, system possible. Right. So I have two final topics for you. This is the lightning round. Mm -hmm. First, you're going to be going to Congress to serve with people who don't understand what a semi-automatic weapon is, and yet they want to make laws that affect 300 plus million Americans. And you have, I think, one of your uh, new colleagues talked about nuking his fellow American citizens who, not literally, but it's so funny that he jumped to that on Twitter when someone said, you know, talking about different regulations and then someone on Twitter responded to him that that would be over his dead body or something to that effect. And he responded, well, the the government has nuked, so it's going to be a short, short fight. So you're going to go have to work with these people. How's that going to how's that going to work on the Second Amendment? Well, uh, it's an important question. And it's one that obviously the uh, new Democrat House is going to go down that road. There's no question about it. I've been in this fight before. It's nothing new. You know, you have to make a choice as to whether you believe that the Second Amendment constitutional recognition of our God given right, by the way, doesn't give us that right simply recognize our God-given right to be able to defend ourselves and defend ourselves not just against somebody intruding in your house and not just uh, somebody in your community, but defend yourself, uh, for example, if, if the federal government were to fail to do its job to secure our borders and say, hypothetically speaking, MS-13 gangs or terrorist organizations uh, on the border of Texas were to be strengthened because of a federal government that's not doing its job, my God-given right to defend myself, my family, and my community, right? Let's talk about that, or let's talk about to the point of the comment that was made about you know nuking the the, the people, yeah. which, which I realized was was it was a response. And well, you can't you can't do anything against the great power of the government when they can just nuke you, right? And I think that undermines the reality of history and what we know when you've got a citizenry that is armed and is able to take care of itself and secure itself, right? I think that's what's lost in this. It's like, well, it's either the government and we got to give them the power and then, you know, too many people are doing bad things with guns, so we've got to eliminate all those. And they forget that when you do that and you separate that, you're giving government all of that authority and all of that power. But more importantly, you're taking away that element of a person, a family, a community, caring for themselves and defending themselves and the way that our militias were created and the way that our, gov our government initially formed its armies and calling the armies and the standing army together, you know, it was because every, you know, able-bodied man had his, you know, musket and his weapon. Um, and the fact that those weapons have uh, advanced and modernized doesn't change that reality. And I think there's a lot of uh, misinformation out there about weapons. There's a lot of misinformation there about school security and about uh, what we're seeing today. What we're seeing today with respect to the abuse of guns is a tragedy that has more to do with the breakdown of families, the breakdown of our culture, the breakdown of, of uh, frankly, our uh, you know drug policies and what's happening with respect to addictions 
these are the things that are causing the hopelessness and the despair that you're seeing uh, unfold with some of these tragedies. So I think we need to focus focus on where the problem actually exists and not attacking people's um, law-abiding citizens' uh, right to defend themselves. I couldn't have said it better th- myself. You hit all the highlights. So the final topic to ask you about, you were counsel for the Senate Judiciary Committee, and you, like the rest of America, watched in rapt attention, I'm sure, to the confirmation process for Justice Brett Kavanaugh. And I remember reading on your Twitter and retweeting several times comments that you made about how absurd it is, how contentious this becomes, because of it underscores that the Supreme Court is not functioning the way that it should be functioning. Can you expand on that a little bit? Sure. I think it'd be two things. If you want a glimpse into what the House of Representatives is likely to look like over the next two years, then look no further than the Senate Judiciary Committee in, in, in September. And uh, <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, some of us are going to have to deal with that, deal with that firsthand, but that's okay. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what we're sent up there to do. And I'm happy to go uh, fight the fight. But to the, your point, the reality is simply this. The idea that the country was hanging on with bated breath as to the confirmation of one man to one court in Washington, D.C., tells you everything you need to know about the extent to which the Supreme Court now has too much power over things that affect our daily lives. It simply was not meant to be that. You don't have to be Thomas Jefferson, who was obviously one of the earlier presidents and and, and members of our founding class that were hostile to a powerful judiciary. You can be somebody that was somewhat more pro-judiciary, if you go back like the Federalist Papers, and, and still recognize today that we've got courts that are stretched well beyond where they were supposed to be. And remind remind the, you know your, your listeners, Article 1, right, which granted power to the Congress, was the first article for a reason, because Congress is supposed to reflect the wishes of the people. And you know, obviously the House of Representatives is the people's house within that. Uh, bicameral uh, Article One, you know, legislature. We need to get. We need to, to take steal a line from Trump, right? We need to make Article One great again. Congress <laughs> needs to do its job, right? Yes. Congress needs to actually legislate. Congress needs to limit the extent to which bureaucrats are making laws uh, by by through the bureaucratic process and the regulatory state. And they need to step in and limit the extent to which judges are overreaching. They can do that. This is not a big deal. I mean, it is a big deal, but it's not something that should be earth shattering, that there should be a robust debate among our legislators who we send there to represent us about who's making decisions on our behalf. By the way, I say that without a a, a desired outcome. In other words, there will be times when a judge might make a decision that isn't, that's going to enrage the left. You know, maybe yeah. make a decision that Roe versus Wade was bad law and they're going to overturn it. Maybe they're going to make a decision that Obamacare is unconstitutional, and the left doesn't like those. The, the question here is, is who should be making decisions? And, and, and the, the judiciary should be there to check Congress and check an overreach and make sure that they're not trampling on, on, on uh, clear rights in the Constitution that are enumerated, but also the uh, powers that Congress are exercising to go pass laws. But at the end of the day, we need to stop waiting for judges to tell us how we're living, what schools we can go to, whether we can pray and when we can do it, what we're able to, you know, what, you know, what marriage is defined at, right? All of these things that should be just, we should decide as people rather than judges. Absolutely. Chip, congratulations again. If people want to follow you on Twitter, what is your Twitter handle and what is your website address? Well, sure. Thanks. It's uh, chiproy.com is my uh, political web website. And uh, chiproy, Texas, C-H-I-P-R-O-Y-T-X is my Twitter handle. And we're on Facebook as well. Although I don't really do that. I'm pretty much always on just Twitter or, or um, you know, reading the news. But look, I appreciate everything that you're doing. And and uh, let's keep up the conversation when I'm in D.C. Let's get together. I'm optimistic. We're in a good place. And we, we got to just keep winning the narrative out there and getting people to understand that if the people stand up, we win. Well, we are excited to have another happy warrior coming to D.C. to fight the good fight. So we're very excited. This is Gail Trotter, host of Right in D.C. You can follow me on Facebook. You can like me on Twitter. You can subscribe to my YouTube station or you can support me on Patreon. This is Right in D.C. You're Right in D.C. with Gail Trotter.